Good evening, friends, enemies, and unacquainted strangers. I welcome you to the disquiet library. I am the curator, and these listless halls house many stories and artworks. This evening, I have a reading from the library collections, where I will be sharing an artwork with you and telling the stories tied to the piece. But before we get to that, I had a few points I wanted to bring up as announcements, I suppose. We have received several complaints and concerns about our library setup. Let me see here. Hmm. It is all well and good that the library has endless shifting halls and that sometimes the books, um, rehome themselves, but the organization is rather quite appalling. It's almost as if it were a dragon's hoard rather than a library, and it's no excuse for leaving books unshelved. A letter given us from a patron, Rosalind O'Donnell. Well, Miss O'Donnell, I take offence to your insinuation that my hoard, um, <laughs> library establishment, is as disorganized as a simple common dragon's wealth. I try to take better care of our collections than that. <laughs> and one more letter I found in the donation bin, tied to two books. Hmm. Care and Creeping of Mimics and Monstrosities by Chester Teefs and On Library Organization by D. Decimal. All right, let us see what this letter has to say. I recognize that you, an upstanding curator with a library sciences degree, likely know more than me when it comes to matters of such how an organization could be run. However, I recognize that sometimes it is nice to have some resources to turn to, especially when one is new to running such an establishment. So please, accept these books as reference points for how one may be able to make the library a more comforting and welcoming place for people, as well as working with the collections to come to a natural order, rather than exclusively bribing them not to nibble on the patrons. Please feel free to call me if you would like some particular aid with anything, and I hope that these resources find you well. Sincerely, a concerned librarian. Well, it seems my little endeavor has drawn in a true librarian. How frightening. I know yours and my kinds have not meshed well in the past, but you seem genuinely concerned and willing to forgive a bookworm their poor habits. I will humor your advice and take a look at these books you have offered me, if only to respect the amicability you have so graciously offered me. Hmm. What is this about a library sciences degree? Well, with those matters addressed, I would like to present to all of you the painting from the collections this week. For those of you who are experiencing this through the audio recordings, you should find a link to view a copy of this month's artwork in the description box or written in the description card wherever you found our audio recordings. This evening's art may have unsettling imagery for some, and the story of today's piece has... notes of death. So this is a warning if you find either of those flavors disagreeable. But for now, let me take you to the shore of the endless forest. Soft, bubbly laughter can be heard spread across the hills. A few children from the nearby village are running through the soft grasses. Large swaths of grass are bent aside as the wind spirits whirl round the children, playfully tossing the children's hair, or every so often carrying the ball out of their hands and a little ways away, much to the protests of the children. Below them, nestled in and amongst the vibrant green fields, are collections of stone houses making up their village, the white dots of sheep comfortingly spread across the hillsides, grazing. The soft puffs of smoke from chimney pots form subtle dark smudges against the brilliant blue of the sky, as though a painter with dirty hands accidentally drummed their hands on the canvas while thinking, leaving smudges of grey paint from the previous day's rain barely visible drifting away on the horizon. Out of the endless woods emerged a few figures with satchels of abundant goods slung over their shoulders. The children stopped to watch as their father knelt down in thanks at the edge of the woods. It was a ritual so familiar, yet still captivating. So to see the gatherers give thanks to the woods, and a note of dim entourage of creatures and forest spirits gathered round, those subtle movements which one may not notice if they hadn't lived this ritual every day during the summer and autumn months. 
The wind spirits gathered themselves up in barely visible bundles before patting the children on their heads and whirling off to join the subtle movements of spirits as they swept away from the gatherers towards the deeper trees. Cocorino, Chucarano, I want you to help us bring these back home. The man who led the gathering party waved and called out to the children as the whole party mulled around a bit, redistributing the gathered goods, while others rested on the soft mulch at the edge of the woods. Soon the boisterous children had found their way down the hill. Whether one could say that they walked was a different story, as one had pushed the other, leading them both to go tumbling down the hill, first in retaliation, but then simply for the joy of rolling as a form of locomotion, ending their escapade to the laughter of the gatherers, and dimly stumbling around to reconstruct an understanding of where it was meant to stand. The party walked off towards the village soon after, with Coconio and Chukurano bringing up the rear with their father. The two brown-haired children were struggling under the weight of their baskets, as of them had taken so many goods out of a sense of wanting to help, and also a sense of wanting to outdo the other in how much they could carry. They determinedly walked side by side with their father, trying not to let the strain show, and peering round their father to double-check that the other one wasn't shirking work. Their father carefully transferred pieces of fruit from each of their baskets into his own back basket, evening out their loads so they could make it back to the village. At one point, one of them caught him, and so he had to pawn off the theft as an attempt of sampling the fruit at which point he was obliged to share the juicy purple meat with the two children before they would catch up with the rest of the party. As the dull, hollow call of the horns called out across the hills to bring back the shepherds and signal the arrival of the gatherers, something stirred in the depths of the woods, out where the trees were deep and thick, where the forest floor dropped away and the thick, gnarled roots haven't seen light for centuries. Something stirred, something ancient and ageless, the will of the forest itself. Maybe it was brought on by the subtle cold notes heralding the coming autumn. Maybe it was brought on by the tentative twittering of the forest creatures who bravely ventured into the depths to tell the powers that be of the people's thanks. Whatever caused its stirring, the old god was waking, and soon pale purple moonlight once again touched the shrouded depths allowing the strange, twisted organisms growing round and substituting its light to once again bloom and seep out of the wood of the ancient trees. As the pale light of morning touched the soft purple mist which had seeped out of the forests, few recognized its ephemeral shade. Those were but two who had lived long enough to hear stories passed on from the last village's elders. They lived on the edge of the village nearest the woods. They had an idea of what must be done, but were apprehensive of the day to come, and following through on the stories. They shared their breakfast together in a cozy bed, with the crackling of fire and hearth, keeping the searching tendrils of pale purple fog from intruding. The two women embraced for the last time, letting their foreheads rest against each other's as last parting bonding connection of two souls who had shared so much life together. One clutched the horn and tome of stories so as to pass on the tales of what must be done, while the other gathered offerings of beads and bread and meat, both adorned in their ceremonial furs and painted after antler headdresses. The mists receded and followed the elder with the offerings towards the woods, the tendrils which were before searching and probing, now in swirling the bundled figure with the welcome guiding draw. The golden rays of the sun brought the children out of the stone huts to discover the other elder sitting in the center of town on the flat stone that gave the village its name and locality. Face stained with tears but clutching the tome of stories, bound and scratched from the hide of animals long past, the children sat for the day, absorbed in the stories and tales of their people, memorizing every word, while the adults prepared. Some gathered sheep and foods, Others started careful bringing sheaths and stacks of dried cured hides to the square so that the tome of stories could be transcribed. By evening, when the story had been told, a great fire cauldron had been constructed atop the flat stone. 
house spirits and barn trolls had waylaid their normal tricks and shyness and could be seen running about their wood and stone hands bringing the goods to the cauldron and making cloth and fibers out of the stored wool the small gathering of candles atop one of the nearby hills where the standing stones were being placed amongst a few dozen a dozen other standing stones on the hill gave the otherwise jovial events in the town a somber note the elderly storyteller was the last to lay her candle down at the stone of her wife taking a moment kneeling over the earth to collect herself before turning to see the village off on its journey with the last of her blessings her wife stood at the drop-off of the forest the broader, typical forest, with its walkable spaces and abundance of forageables, giving away in jagged cliff to the deeper, tangled trees, for even at the height of summer, the light that shone was filtered at best. There she stood, clutching her gnarled staff, as the trees themselves trembled. A cold front of wind was the first herald of its approach, rushing up the cliff face and shaking the canopy as it fled. She sat down, hanging her feet over the edge in waiting. She held out some gifts to the wind and the invisible spirits, which pressed in around her anxiously and excitedly, awaiting the moment with her. Her handfuls of seeds were quickly scattered and dispersed amongst the spirits, until she stopped them, saying with a laugh and softness in her voice, We need to save some for the fallen spirit. Soon, out of the swirling, iridescent purple mists and fog, and the, the looming silhouette, of the deeper tree and the looming silhouette of the deeper trees stepped the falling spirit despite its body resembling a deer in structure it leapt and climbed the ancient trees with a panther's grace and agility settling by folding itself on a nearby branch to the village altar the air smelled of autumn and damp leaves and warm <laughs> friendly celebrating the harvest and holding together with family and telling stories so the sun may return again the scene was bathed in the golden glow of sunset, through the trees and cold purple glow of the moon and stars, which existed at the base of the antlers, where one might expect a skull or other such features. The elder held out their bundles of offerings, and bade not look at the spirit, gently scooped up the gifts, and gently lifted her face with its branching leaves at the end of its slowly whirling tail in a voice that was felt as part of existence rather than heard the spirit spoke thank you you have looked after these forests and these lands when i could not is there anything you would request of me the spirit's voice carried with it gratitude of the forest and the aches of the trees and the boughs hung with berries and the fruit and the stories and songs sung by the trees to speak of the humans hunts and omens and oncoming rain the elder responded by asking of her wife. The cracks in her voice in turn reflected those smaller stories which the fallen spirit was less accompanied to, domestic stories of long winters, nights bundled together with the embers of the fire running low, or the calm still evenings where some of the children of the village would come visit to hear stories of yore or merely because they wanted an excuse for a cookie of the first stone laid in foundation and the rough hands that thatching a roof the spirit drank it all in tasting these unfamiliar flavors slowly letting the bought gifts drip away into liquid moonlight flowing into its being you will see her again if you wish for as her spirit protects your people as long as you wish that the boundary be where your stories lie so will you I appreciate your arrival and kindness to me. The spirit gestured with its woody branching antlers to the gifts, all but disappeared into silvery pools on its tail leaves. It has been a while, I suppose for you, and it's never easy to leave those you care for. By the time the sunset had ended, the golden skies receded to the deep blue-black of the sea, and the two nestled together in silence, on the thick branch, merely talking and watching the adornment of the sky in glittering finery through a gap in the dense canopy above. Are you ready? Yes. I am settled now. Thank you. Very well, then. With a deep breath, where the spirit's massive flank shifted under the old woman, the air around them was bathed in the same purple glow, and suddenly the woman began to fade away, 
with fingers and furs and body all slipping away into hordes of green lightning bugs that swam about the spirit and surrounding trees. In the center of the village, her wife sat off, looking off down the path away from the woods, watching after the last light of the village moving on to a new home. Her blessings given, <clears throat> she too started to burn away into swirls of orange sparks which rose and settled, mingling with the ashes of cooking embers and still glowing on the fat stone. The wind carried her embers and the soft flutterings of lightning bugs around, keeping them together and watching over the hamlet and empty buildings until their occupants would return in spring. Holding forever in that strange place where the hills form the shoreline of the endless forest, with its wind spirits and deep green trees awash with scents and stories. Well, that concludes today's collections showcase. I hope you can find enjoyment in perusing the other works here at the Disquiet Library. Please remember, if you want to commission new works to be added to the library or to your own personal collections, we can be commissioned via the artistry link to be found with the treats near the donation box or in the description box or card with your audio recording. Thank you, shadowy wanderers of the night, and have a wonderful evening.